Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure uh, to, to uh, present you remotely from, from Israel. I wish also I could uh, uh, join the meeting uh, in, um, physically. Um, and today, uh, kind of like, it's like midnight for me. Hopefully that's like the middle of the day for you. I'm going to tell you about genetic privacy. I call it a balanced view, but this was like two months ago, and now I have some, again, I'm thinking whether this will be like a balanced view or not. I would let the audience to judge that. Uh, one important piece uh, is that um, I'm right now, like my full, uh, full time uh, position is the CEO of 11 Therapeutics. However, 11 Therapeutics uh, is developing nucleic acid therapeutics uh, drugs with uh, AI and, and the combinatorial chemistry. We are not working on genetic privacy. So, this is really stuff that I was uh, working on during my academic years. So, and actually my interest in genetic privacy goes to the days that, you know, this was like talking about like almost 20 years ago that I used to be a, a whitehead hacker of, uh, of banks in Israel. And uh, we used to be invited by financial institutes and banks to check the security of their systems. What you see over here, this is myself 20 years ago. I had a bit more hair, no beard. This is due to COVID, right? And... The door that you see over here is the door for a, a, one of the largest uh, IT departments uh, of a bank in Israel. That's me. 10 p.m. right now. Now, this door is controlled by a fingerprint reader, which is a kind of like very simple device. You put your fingerprint. If it, you're in the database, the door would open. And also, it also control, is controlled by an intercom. That's another device. You press on the on the button, it calls the secretary, and if he or she knows you, they would press eight and the door would open and you can enter. Right now it's 10 p.m., no one is in the building, no secretary. What I'm going to show you, you that each one of you can open this door in 10 minutes using your own cell phone quite easily. Look at that. So we are calling the secretary. I'm now going to play eight from my own phone, the, the tone eight. And opening the door and taking the money. Don't do that, at, at, don't try this at home. Now, the, after you, you, you present this movie to the uh, security, um, uh, chief information security officer of the bank, you have quite constructive discussion how to make their systems harder. And part of kind of like the conversation of this, of this talk is, how like how we should treat genetic privacy and how really we should um, uh, be able to think about genetic privacy in a constructive manner. Now, I would like to emphasize genetic privacy is far more complicated than protecting your bank accounts. We kind of like figured out how to protect bank accounts, like my money is in the bank, I don't worry about it so much. But for genetic privacy, we don't have good solutions right now. And why is that? because of a few societal and computational challenges. The first one is that we need to share genetic information. Um, what you see over here, this like a nice uh, uh, um, uh, young girl over here, she suffers from a hemifacial microsomia, a strong asymmetry in her face. She was presented in a clinic in Israel a few, like almost like a decade ago, and we conducted exome sequencing to identify the causative mutation, which is a duplication in one gene. Now, we sequenced her, but we were able to solve this uh, genetic disease because we had the sequencing results of thousands and of thousands of normal Ashkenazi Jews that genetically match to her ethnic background and to contrast in order to identify this causative mutation. So to help this young girl, I had to have access to a lot of genetic data. So we must share genetic data in order to advance biomedical research. That's something we, we need to find a way to share data. We cannot, if we just order the data to ourselves, we will not be able to advance biomedical research and help these patients. On the other hand, we see the advent of consumer genomics in the past kind of like a decade or so. And now people talk about more than 50 million uh, uh, individuals who have been tested as part of direct-to-consumer genomic companies. And uh, people do that for fun. They really want to learn about their past. So they also share their information for quite some other types of mechanisms. The second challenge that we have 
is that it's not so easy to understand genetic privacy. It's much more tricky. Let's take, for example, Jim Watson, right? Jim Watson, he, Nobel laureate, discovered the structure of DNA. So you could imagine he's quite informed about genetic privacy. However, um, when Jim Watson, he was the, the one of the first uh, few genomes that were shared out there, that ju he just sequenced like himself. This was like, I think, 454, and he shared his entire genome. However, Jim was concerned that people would know his APOE status and therefore can infer his risk for Alzheimer because APOE4, if you're homozygote, it increases your risk for Alzheimer by about 16 fold. So what Jim did, said, okay, I'm a Nobel laureate, I'm smart. I can just share my entire genome, but I will just remove the APOE gene. So I'll just like reduct it. But then the problem is that you can use genetic imputation. There is a covariance. And, and Bonnie, do you see my cursor? Fantastic. Yes. The, since genetic variants are coming in the background of the haplotype, there is a covariance between whatever you erased over here and other, hap, other markers that you did not erase. So what you can do, you can use genetic imputation and complete back the APOE status. And this was a paper published by smart researchers showing that they can actually get back and recover the APOE status of Jim Watson. Now, guys, this is Jim Watson. If Jim cannot protect his data, how can we protect our own data? So kind of like take a message is that intuition is where, like genomic, genetic privacy is where intuition dies. We need to find like more quantitative tools for that. Now, I want kind of like to emphasize the problem in a more mathematical way. How simple is it to identify each one of you, right? When we talk about anonymity, anonymity is the word saying being lost in the crowd. What is anonymity? I want not to be distinguished from someone else. So let's assume that I have a group of individuals over here and I would like to find this person in red and think that I take this group and I ask one question. I ask, is this a male or a female, the person that I'm looking for? Someone tells me, oh, that's a male. Okay, so I can put like, you know, separate it and then go to all the males. That will cut the group into half. Then let's say I ask, uh, is this person right in his like left hand or right hand or whatever, right? And let's say that it cuts it again. And then I ask, okay, is this person is like uh, more taller than average or less? And then it will cut it. And I can keep up, I can keep coming with simple questions, keep differentiating the person from the group until I collect enough identifiers. Information theory tells us that the, the number, like the ambiguity that we have at the beginning to find a person is basically that it can be quantified by the entropy level, by the number of bits. And let's say I want to identify any person on earth and I have equal uh, probability for each one of you. Let's say you are a murderer and I would like to identify you. On earth, there are about 7 billion people. Log two, right? It's like entropy level of 7 billion people is only 33 bits of information. So I need to collect only 33 bits of information to identify each one of you. Surprisingly small and discouraging because think how many bits we have in the genome that could be quite unique. Let me just give you some examples over here. So sex quite clearly gives you one bit of information. If I ask you about your eye color, people in the US, if they have some have brown eyes, some green eyes, some blue eyes, 1.4 bits of information. If I know your height to a resolution of a centimeter, that's five bits of information. And if I know your surname, that's 13 bits of information. So quite quickly by adding this, and everything is for the US population, by the way, what I presented here. Um, so all these bits of information can add it up quite quickly and really differentiate you from the rest of the population. So it's not easy to uh, protect anonymity. Okay, the third challenge that I would like to uh, um, mention is that you say, okay, so wh why do I care about that, right? It's just gen genomic information, you can share my gene, I, can, I want to share my genome, who cares? The problem is that in genomic information, and my slides are not moving for whatever reason, here, you are not only affecting yourself, you're also affecting your family. And there is a question who should, you know, like once you are kind of like sharing your genome, maybe it affects other individuals who do care about their genetic privacy. And in fact, in all the types of, of uh, methods that I'm going to show you, you're going to see that there is like by 
collecting information from one identified individuals. We can leverage that information through deep genealogical ties to identify other people who wish to be uh, protected or wish to be anonymous. Um, so for tonight, since that's midnight for me and afternoon for you, but the plan for tonight is that I will tell you about two stories, how we can actually um, reveal information from DNA, like two routes to breach genetic privacy. The first route is that I'm going to show you we can infer surnames from DNA in males. So the way that it works basically is that they, like we, what we're going to do, we're going to leverage the correlation between the Y chromosome and surnames. For instance, here we have the Smith family, right? A nice family, Mr. Smith and Mrs. Smith, and they are having a son. In most, uh, when they have a son, the father will give his son his Y chromosome, and in most Western societies, also his surname. Now, if this son is getting married and also has a son, he will give him his Y chromosome and also his surname. And what you see that this creates a correlation between the Y chromosome and the surname. Genetic genealogy companies, I realize that there is such correlation, and some of them offer a test in which you will swab. And these days, you know, we used to like swab our nose, but this is not a COVID test. This is like a DNA test. We swab our mouth, like in the side. It's like less invasive. And then you will put it in an envelope. Don't forget to add $100 so they can test your, like they will test your DNA. And then they will go and analyze a series of short tandem repeats on your Y chromosome. Short tandem repeats are markers that look like that, just repetitive elements. There are many of them in the genome and they identified a bunch of them on the Y chromosome. They're, they measure the lengths using capillary electrophoresis. And then they will put this data, if you want, at that time, when, when you conduct the study on a website called ysearch.org, it doesn't exist anymore. And in this website, they put your Y chromosome haplotype with your surname if you consent for that. And in fact, I consented for this process because it's a lot of fun. I can connect my patrilineal relatives, find the black sheep of my family, just on about my patrilineal line. So many people uh, um, put their Y chromosome data and their surname. And at that time, we conducted a study. We had access to two databases, smgf.org and ysearch.org. Um, I said that time because a few years ago, they actually both com like the companies just removed these databases, I think because of all the genetic privacy issues. But a decade ago, this was publicly accessible. There are other databases today, but we're not going to that. Anyhow, with these two databases, at that time, 2012, you had access to 140,000 publicly accessible surname Y uh, short term repeats data. And we downloaded all these databases. We just we basically scraped them. And what you see that the records reflect the US population, which is quite nice. Here is like the number of records in the database for each surname. And here is the surname prevalence based on the US census. So Smith is the most prevalent name. And then we have Wilson, Jones, and, and so on. And there is a very good correlation. So it's a nice sample of the population. By the way, the surnames over here are Hispanic surnames. So they're a bit underrepresented uh, in, the, in these databases compared to the population. Okay, so we ask ourselves, you know, like how to search data, the databases and we develop an algorithm that works as follows. The algorithm tries to estimate the time to the most recent common ancestor between the person of interest, the person that we want to find uh, his surname and a database record. So if I have my target, I will go to each record in the database and I will try to estimate the, the time to the most common recent ancestor based on the number of matching Y STRs between the two haplotypes. And each STR is its own mutation rate. We also calibrated that so we can get a good a probability distribution function out of it. So to get this estimator. Now, if the common ancestor, all the males in this audience are connected, right? We are all connected through like patrilinear lines. But if the common ancestor, <clears throat> we estimate it lived thousands of years ago, we say mm, we don't really share the same surname because surnames is a relatively recent uh, invention about 400 years ago. So yeah, if the record and this target 
go like thousands of years ago, no, we, they don't share the same surname. However, in some cases, we might be lucky and we find that they share a quite recent common ancestor, maybe five, maybe 10 generations ago. And then we say, okay, that's like a more likely surname. And we prioritize all the different records in the database. And if the best record passes a certain threshold, we say, here is the surname. If it's below a user specified threshold, we say, I don't know. So we tested empirically, we took a YSTR of real individuals from the US population, and we tested them against these two databases. We ran our surname inference algorithm, and we checked whether the surname inference algorithm, what we got is the same surname of these individuals. We ran the test over 900, uh, with 900 individuals, adjusted it to like the surname distribution of the population, did some corrections to get a, a good uh, a estimator. Um, and what we found was that for US, mostly like, you know, basically US, uh, uh, Europe, like uh, European descendant individuals, we can get at that time 12% successful recoveries. 5% will be wrong recoveries and 83% will just the algorithm would say, I don't know. Now 12% is not a big number, but on the other hand, if you think about a database, you know, we think about a 1 million uh, genome project, that's actually hundreds of thousands of surname inferences. It's quite a lot. So it's not like a, a very marginal pro like a, a, a event to get. You get it enough times to be concerning enough. But, but, but before we continue, also one question that they have is that, okay, I got the surname. Can I get to the individual, right? And the first thing to kind of like understand is that we don't get very common surnames. The algorithm quite, is quite bad in getting the common surnames because they were invented multiple times during the surname system. Smith, for instance, is an occupation. If someone works with like Ivor, right? And so it's not something that potentially two individuals, the Smith surname would be connected. On the other hand, people with very, very rare surname are not in the database because they're just like it's heavy tail distribution, you don't get them in the database. So we get kind of like the mildly rare surnames. In most cases, these are individuals with like surname frequency of one out of 40,000 individuals on average. And that means that the surname already, if I can infer it, is a strong identifier because I can now go and zoom in from the 330 million people that live in the US into a much smaller population of only a few tens of thousands of individuals of males in the US. So it's much smaller. I already reduced my search space quite dramatically. I gained many bits of information. And we conducted a simulation. We assumed that if you have access to data that is um, um, under the safe harbor of EPA, you, you can have the age and the state of the individual. And let's assume that you ran a successful surname inference attack. So let's say that I get, and, and we simulated based on the US census, the different like the age distribution, the state of residents, uh, the state population distribution, and also the covariance between them because in Florida, people are older, we took that into account. So we just simulated, we said, okay, let's take a person age 40, lives in Colorado, surname Adams. What would be the chance of like, like how many people in the population would have such an attribute? And we conducted this simulation for 100,000 rounds. It sounds a lot, but actually it's a fraction of a second. It just sounds impressive. And what we got is the following distribution. We found that if you have the age, the state, and the surname of a person, you can reduce your search space into 12 males. That's the median search space. 12 is a small number. At this point, I can actually call to each individual and ask them on the phone, like, did you participate in a genetic study? Maybe I will not do that. Someone with a nice, like, British accent. I think British accent would do that. So let's let's do this. So you can use social engineering. You can use other types of methods. The take-home message, surname, state, and age gets you very close to the person. And we can get the surname from the genetic information. Okay. So far, I just showed you simulations, right? And you can tell me any come on, on the computer, I can prove whatever I want. That's ISMB, right? We can do magics on the computers. Show me the real data. Okay. So we decided to focus on the genome of Craig Venter, the first person that was sequenced. 
And we used an algorithm called Lobster that we developed uh, years ago to um, genotype, to, to retrieve from uh, high throughput sequencing data, short tandem repeats alleles and, and, to, and to genotype them. And then what we basically got is like, we, we look at this Y chromosome, we retrieved all these like Y STRs and for each uh, locus, we just put the number of repeats that we identified on the locus. So for instance, if in DYS 4458, we had 17 repeats, we just put 17 repeats. We went to Y search, we put all this like low side, we clicked on the search button. And then after a second, this is what we got. Venter was the top match. From the genomic data of Craig Venter, the database told us, what's his surname? Okay, but now you might ask that, okay, you got Venter, but there are thousands of Venters out there. Can you actually get to Dr. Craig Venter? And the answer is yes. We know that Craig Venter, um, he is like, is Venter, let's say he, we know that he lives in California because state is not a protected uh, uh, identifier in HIPAA. Uh, let's say that we know that he was born in 1946, again, not a protected piece of information that is a male, has a Y chromosome, right? You can go to a website called ussearch.com, put all these four pieces of information and you get that record. To get two records, one of which is our friend, J. Craig Venter. You can see where he lived. You can see all his, like, I think, former wives. And if you pay $5 and you get the full report, I think you can even get his uh, phone number and email but we, were, we went like with low budget, so we didn't pay for the full report. So I just showed you how we can get from the genome of Greg Venter to the person. But now you might ask yourself, you need very nice, but you knew beforehand that this is Greg Venter. So come on, like, that's not like a big deal, right? So then we decided, okay, let's try to identify anonymous genomes. We went to the thousand genomes. We focused on the Utah population. Thousand genomes is publicly available. We genotype with lobster 10, uh, uh, CU genomes. We searched in these two databases, Ysearch and uh, SMGF, and we got some certain predictions. Um, and then we took one of these, like uh, um, one of the pedigrees, and in this pedigree we identified the surname of the patrilineal grandfather or the paternal grandfather, and the maternal grandfather. We got the two surnames. And we just went to Google. Now, I'm not showing the exact details of which pedigree, just to kind of like respect the, the privacy of this family. We did something on Google very similar to that. Not exactly like that, but quite similar to that. And then the top, the top uh, 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 link was an obituary that exactly describes the pedigree that we have in the 1,000 genomes. The number of kids was the same, and that's a big family. The birth order of males and females was exactly the same. And it's like flipping a coin like multiple times and be able to predict that. We also we knew for some of these people the year of birth, which was exactly the same to what we identified in this pet, in this obituary. The surnames of the of the the maiden name of the mother matched the surname of the paternal grandfather, of the maternal grandfather, the surname of the father matched the surname of the uh, paternal grandfather. So we calculated what's the probability that we identified the wrong household in Utah. And the probability is something like five times 10 to the minus nine, that this is like the incorrect uh, identification. And we said, okay, fantastic. We submitted this manuscript uh, to science and they told us, yeah, very nice, but it's like beginners like show us that you can do it again. I said, okay, okay, let's do it again. So we tried, like this was our first pedigree. We tried it again with another thousand genomes pedigree and another gen thousand genomes pedigree. At this point, we had so much information that we can actually reconstruct the connection between the individuals in the thousand genomes that we identified to the individuals in the databases who contributed their DNA. And you can see here basically these links between these individuals. So this one was, this is, was the second cousin once removed that participated in genetic genealogy project and identified the thousand genomes pedigree. This was, I would say it's complicated, but it's like your grand, grand, grandchildren of your brother or something like that, I don't know, of your brother, great grandchildren of your brother and some other individuals. The take home message, we don't need the same person to be in the database to identify another person in a research project. 
they can be unlinked. Unlike any other type of uh, uh, biometric data, DNA travels through deep genealogical lines between individuals and allow you to identify people who are not in the database. So that creates a very powerful, that's the most powerful thing about DNA identification. You can have a very small database and identify people who are not in the database because of this uh, genealogical ties. And we breach, if you take all these individuals, we breach the privacy close to 50 CU centers. We published that in science. We also waited a bit to get uh, the response of the NIH to that. So we published it back to back and we notified them beforehand and, and we tried to deal with it in a really constructive manner. This was covered extensively by, by the media. Uh, and uh, it took some time to publish this manuscript. Now, a decade later, I can tell you, I was like, you know, this manuscript was rejected forever until first they told me it doesn't work and then they told me it's too scary to publish but i'm really glad by, by by the outcome so that's this manuscript okay so i showed you how we can identify people through the y chromosome what about the rest of the genome and let me show you how this thing works that's the second story i'm going to tell you so another so we talked about y chromosome now we talk about the autosome consider the following pedigree that we have over here of like multiple individuals like multiple individuals connected to this like uh, ancestral couple now let's assume that this pedigree you see here you have the third cousins over here these third cousins received some bits of chromosomes of dna from this ancestral couple and since they received the, an identical piece of dna from this ancestral couple and basically through the process of, of recombination, we call these pieces identity by descent segments or IBD segments. And they just look, if you look at the kind of like the two genomes of individuals, you just see a series of markers that are just the same for kind of like multiple uh, loci, like a burst of similarity. And then you can know that here, that these two individuals are the same and therefore they're potentially related. So we can screen our database, like every, the genetic genealogy databases, we can screen them on a daily basis. And every time individuals are getting tested, they, we can actually identify and see whether they have relatives in the database. And that's a quite powerful technique because this is some empirical uh, uh, results from a paper by Huff et al. Genome Research showing that you can identify third cousins by more than 85%, uh, uh, by your power to detect third cousins is over 85%. Now, how many of you know your third cousin? I worked in genealogy for over a decade and I barely know my third cousins, right? I know my, some of my second cousins. So it's a very powerful process because suddenly you can connect individuals that you, just beyond the, the knowledge of, the, of, of your genealogy. So for genealogists, that's a very powerful technique. And in fact, this created many success stories as we call them at the genetic genealogy community of individuals that did a genetic test and suddenly found lost relatives like this. Like, and, and all the examples are from my heritage. I used to be the CSO of my heritage. And you see here like this, like two half sisters that separated at like uh, very, very early age, found each other. They just lived in the two parts of San Francisco. They never knew that they're so close geographically. Uh, these two Holocaust survivors that, that uh, are our family that identified after decades and we have this father and his daughter after a decade, just by, you know, and I hear, keep hearing these stories, like when you walk in this domain on a daily basis. In fact, one of the most important stories is this person. His name is Dotan, and he allowed me to share with you his story. Dotan was, uh, is an adoptee from Brazil uh, in the 80s. He lives not far away from where I live, and he looked for his uh, biological family. When he, was an, when he was 18 years old, he opened his uh, adoption uh, files, went to Brazil, but everything was basically like wrong in his files. Like he couldn't actually get any piece of information. Like the, the, the file were like the, 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 his date of birth didn't match like any certificate in the hospital that he visited. And this was a rural hospital. So very like, he was a bit like, you know, upset by this entire process. He thought maybe he was kidnapped. So I told Dotan, I told him, why don't you come to my heritage and, and share your file? Like, why don't you like, you know, put your DNA, let's see where can, we can find you. 
At that time, we also conducted this like a campaign to bring individuals who've been uh, adoptees just to kind of like bring their DNA so we, we might be able to un unify people. Now, in my heart, I knew that the, the chances are slim because we have very bad coverage of people in Brazil. It's a big country and only like very few percentage of the population, a fraction of percentage of the population are in our database. But I said, maybe it will help, right? Cannot, cannot hurt. So he uploaded his data to my heritage, and after a week, we found a match to a, a half sister, his half sister that lives in New Zealand, that at around the same time in 2018 also uploaded her data to my heritage. And they found each other and told me, listen, this is like the first time I, I saw someone that looks like me. So we're able to solve this mystery for him. And since both of them are adoptees, it's quite unlikely that he was kidnapped because nobody kidnaps from the same mother twice. They are connected through their mother. You can see it through their Y chromosome. And this story is very dear to me because Dotan is also my first cousin. So I was able to help someone like in my close family, right? And I thought this way I showed my family that all these like genetic algorithms that I, I work on are not just, you know, for like some fun, but actually they can change the life of people and they can saw that from first hand. Now, the problem in, in uh, um, this type of uh, relative matching is that sometimes people don't end up at the same database. In fact, Totan initially was tested. This was years, because, like, years ago in FTDNA, didn't find anyone. And his half-sister was tested with Ancestry. But my heritage allowed them to upload their genetic data as a form of a text file into the database. Let's see how it works. Your raw genetic data, all the, all the companies allow you to download your file. It looks like basically like a long text file, like basically like a CSV file with some headers. The headers are just like unimportant. You don't need them. And it's a long list of like your RSIDs, chromosome, position, and the alleles. So you can, this like, I think 10 megabyte uh, uh, text file, you can just upload it. And at that time, my heritage had 2.5 million people and, and a, few comp a few kind of like outlets allowed you to upload your information to bring people from different databases together to break the silo. Now, I'm going to focus on GEDmatch because GEDmatch at that time had a very, very relaxed privacy, um, um, privacy uh, policy at that time. So the FBI thought, you know, if people can upload text files to these databases, I can also upload a text file to the database of potential criminals. Let's do that. Let's see what happens. So what they did, they focused on the Golden State Killer. This is one of the most notorious criminals in the history of humanity. He murdered more than 12 people and raped more than 50 women in more than 20 years of operation. His DNA was everywhere, right? When you, when you rape someone, you leave quite a lot of DNA behind you. But the, the, the police didn't have any match to their forensic database because he was never arrested by, by anything. The only thing they knew about him that he, he, like, he operates in California in two locations and that he potentially has some sort, like they estimated his age and they knew that he has some sort of like a, police training, because they saw how he evades the police, they thought he was a former cop. But they, they spent tens of millions of dollars to capture him. He was one of the most wanted people at the FBI at least. Nothing. For 30, since like the 70s he was operating. Nothing. So then they took his DNA, they genotyped all his markers, rendered the file to look like a nice direct-to-consumer file that I showed you. Just a text file, right? and uploaded the data to GEDmatch. And then they found a third cousin match. And they put a team of genealogists that built one of the largest family trees in the world of more than 1,000 individuals and tried to see like who would fit his profile. And after some triangulation, they found this person that lives in North California. He's in his 70s, former police. Maybe this is the person. They went to his house secretly collected DNA from the door, uh, from the knob of his door and genotyped it and found a perfect match to the crime scenes. Bingo. That's the person. They got a, a warrant, arrested him, brought him to justice, and he serves life now in uh, California. And since then, they use this strategy to identify, now it's hundreds. At that time, we did the research. This was like tens of people. 
right? So if you ask the like detectives, what's the most important innovation in forensics in the past decade, they tell you this like strategy, be able to upload to genetic databases, to publicly available databases and find matches. But when we kind of like approach this four years ago, we said, okay, like what are the chances? Like how good is this strategy? Is this like, you know, this is like a lottery ticket or we can now identify every person in the United States. So to do that, we, First, we created, uh, we, we, we tried empirically. We took, we look at the DNA database of my heritage. As I said, I was a chief science officer, so I could do that. And we took, every time we took a person from the database and we screened all the other individuals in the database, 1.28 million individuals. And we keep doing like a for loop for each individual in the database. We excluded all the very close batches of 700 centimorgans and less. The reason is that, or, or more, sorry. So the reason is that all these close matches are first cousins or closer family. The problem is that in Christmas, people usually buy these kits for themselves and for a family member. But usually you don't buy it for your second cousin. You just buy it for like up to like a first cousin. So we just remove them from the for our analysis to be able not to um, create a certain bias. And then for each search, we ask, what's the top person that we can identify despite not having your very close family? So the process looks like that. Here is the probability to find a match as a function of the total IBD sharing and in centimorgans. Now, I just annotated this IBD sharing also to classes of relatives. So that will be first cousin once removed that's the range that we typically see them the 95 percentile with the median that second cousin between 100 to about 400 again with that's the median and and so on so if you look at kind of like third cousins and let's say 100 centimorgans we have roughly 60 percent chance of identifying individuals so you have 60 percent chance in our database of 1.2 million people to find a third cousin like at least one and of course, again, these databases are a bit more like a, a overrepresented of people with European heritage. So our results are typically are potentially more relevant for this population. But think about a database of 1.28 million people. We can have like 60% chance to find someone that is a third cousin. And that's with like 2018 data. We repeated the same analysis also with GEDmatch because they have this like lax privacy policy. So we can just like try also with GEDmatch and, and try different genomes at random, and we got very similar results with a similar size database, showing that the results are <coughs> robust. Sorry. Okay, then we ask, okay, that's, that's fantastic, but these databases are growing. What's the probability for a larger database to find someone in the population? So for that, we uh, developed this model in which we simulated we took, in fact, we, we took two individuals and we asked, okay, what's the uh, probability that they are connected G uh, generations ago? And we created a probability distribution function based on coalescent uh, model. Then we said, okay, if they are connected, what's the probability that they are genetically related that we can detect these IBD segments that are above a certain threshold? And you can model that quite easily using analytical tools and, and you have probability distribution function for that. And then we said, okay, now let's estimate that we keep repeating the process when we have in the database X percentage of the population and we keep repeating the same process, what's the top one? What, what should I get? Some caveats in this modeling, we assume no population structure because these individuals are like, we, we just assume it's like everyone can, can marry everyone else, no consanguinity and just random representation of the database. So with these caveats, this is what the model estimated. What you see over here on the y-axis, where's my cursor, the y-axis, that's a probability for a match is a function of the database coverage of the population. So 1% is about 3 million people in the US, 2%, 6 million people, and so on. That's for first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, and fourth cousins. Let's focus on third cousins, like the Golden State Killer. We estimated that in 2018, about 80% of the US population could be retrieved using this technique. Like you can get a third cousin match, sorry, using this technique. And since 
family tree DNA started working with the FBI, giving them another 1 million genomes. In 2019, it grew into something like 99% to find a third cousin match. And potentially today, as these databases are getting larger, the number is even bigger and bigger to find third cousin matches. So this technique is becoming more and more powerful. Okay, so you now ask me again, okay, and if you just got a third cousin, can you get to the individual, not just the third cousin, who cares about the third cousin, right? We want to find a person of interest. And the answer is yes, because as I told you, once we can get the search space to be small enough, it's very easy to kind of like dice it and get the individual. So if I have, let's say the US population, 325 million people, if I have a third cousin match, we estimated that it reduces the search space into 850 people on average. Tiny, right? Just this match will already reduce the search space into 850 people. Now, let's say that, uh, you know, usually like uh, serial killers, there is actually a manuscript on that. I, I read it, it's quite interesting. They walk within about 20 miles from where they live. Like if you're like a serial killer and you live in New York, you will not take the train to Philly. You, you operate in the New York area. So we said, you know what, let's kind of like be more conservative and let's assume that if all the murders are in New York, I will put like 100 mile radius around this, like all the like murders. And I will say, okay, I need someone in this geography. We calculated the probability of like finding people across like these geographies, cousins being like spread across the population. And we found that this geographical constraint reduces the search space to 370 individuals on average. Then let's assume that we know the decade of age of the person. We know that the Golden State Killer should be in his 70s. If we do that, this reduces the search space, just a decade of age, to 33 individuals. And then we know that we're looking for a male. We have the search space, 16.5 individuals. And this is without any like actual investigation. You don't even arrest anyone at this point. We don't like at this point, we can use ordinary investigative techniques. To, uh, to find a person. So the take home message is that once you have the match, the genetic match, three pieces of information will already get your search space to be quite tractable. Okay, so I told you about some, all the problems, but we also wanted to come with a solution at least for this issue, for this one. And we want, like, think about, it. we want people to keep uploading their data to databases, like genetic databases. like. We're talking about digital uploading, not taking the test, but digital upload the data to, to databases like my cousin. On the other hand, if the police uploads the data, we want to have like maybe a conversation. Maybe it's okay, maybe it's not okay. We want to have some gatekeeping. And, and also remember, it, it might not be the police. It might be Vladimir from the KGB that can also upload the data. So we want to create a process that will separate between legitimate genealogists and illegitimate ones. Now. The legitimate genealogists, they use the regular direct-to-consumer labs, right? They send their sample, they like, use these like swabs, right? They send this to the lab. This will go, and there are only like four or five labs, right? There is like Ancestry.com, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and some, maybe another like one or two tiny companies that actually do this type of tests. And then there are all the illegitimate users who, you know, Vladimir from the KGB doesn't send the crime scene sample, this tiny bit of DNA using this box because there is not enough DNA. Vladimir from the KGB will use the KGB lab to sequence the data, impute it, have it like much enhanced because the data is the DNA quite like not in good position usually in, in uh, cases of like you collect it from the field and then we'll upload it digitally. So what we suggested was that the direct to consumer, the legitimate ones, will sign the data using a private key. And then when you upload as a user, you upload the data to whatever like third party, the third party will identify the signature, will validate it using the public key and show, okay, that's a 23 me data, I can process it. So if this is the file, what we just suggested to add another field, like a signature and like a long, long, it's like a long bits, like I just put like this beginning, but a lot of like gibberish text over here that will tell me, ah, that's a 23andMe file. 
let me verify the public key. Oh, that's like validated. Nobody changed the bit in this file. I can process the information. This will be able to separate between the legitimate and the illegitimate people. The problem is that everyone thought it's a very nice idea. It's seamless for the user, will not create any problem. I was not able to convince 23andMe and Ancestry to do to follow and actually to adopt that strategy. And this was just like I had like many discussions with them, and then COVID hit, and everyone just thought about the pandemic. So that's like a, an idea in a manuscript. So everything that I told you until now was published in another paper in science in 2018, including this strategy. Um, so it's there, and you can uh, yeah, read the manuscript. Uh, and I would like kind of like to conclude about like you know think about genetic privacy for a second and about privacy in general. So one one thing to ask ourselves, okay, so everything is you know looks like interesting from a technical perspective. I'm sure that you know computationally many challenges, but do we really understand? privacy it's it's not an easy question and i thought i understood privacy and maybe some, like i can only see you bonnie but i usually ask people did you hear about ashley madison the people say i, I what's ashley madison seven years ago or so ashley Med like ashley madison used to be a website that the slogan was life is short have an affair and this website had 37 million people connected to it Someone hacked the website and released the entire information, email addresses, credit card uh, numbers, uh, sexual orientation, cheating, uh, sexual preference, because people said what they like. Um, also, the passwords were protected by shitty MD5. So that's like the worst thing that you can get from a, from a website. There are 2 million households in Israel, about 200,000 uh, Israeli email addresses in this website. So it affects 10% of the population. People from the Israeli parliament were like, you know, their email address was in the database. So you can understand that's a very like, you know, like that's like a problem. And I thought, you know, that's like, that's the skies are falling. This is like, this is the worst thing that can happen, you know, from like a privacy breach. That's worse than my genome, right? If I was at, at Ashley Madison, I wouldn't want my, my email to be out there. And you know what? Even people in New York Times said they're going to be like an Ashley Madison recession because like we're going to see so many divorces now after everyone would learn that you cheated your wife or something. So, you know, we will see like probably like people will move to smaller apartments and we'll see a spike in smaller apartments. And I thought like, I understand privacy, I should invest, and make some money out of it, right? That'll be great. And you know what? Nothing happened. No one cares. Seven years later, no one cares. Nobody like, nobody remembers even Ashley Madison. In fact, Ashley Madison keeps like, this is like, you know, this is not like up to date, but a few years ago I checked. It keeps like operating. It keeps the only, only pe person that actually resigned was the CEO. By the way, he was discovered that he was cheating as well. Although he said like, I'm not using the website or whatever. Actually, he was like also cheating. But he's the only person that resigned. The company, at, at least like a few years ago when I checked, was still like after this leak, four years later, was still operating. People actually enjoyed this, like they enjoyed it so much that it's like more popular than, you know, like scientific like websites, like Sanger, academic UK, right? So it's super hard to predict genetic privacy. People can freak out. You can have a massive amount of like leak of data, unpredictable. You know what? Here is another thing, another example about how people don't have like how privacy is kind of like a, the attitude is malleable. It's, it's like it's changing all the time. Okay, what do we see here? That's a nature manuscript by Facebook. Facebook in 2012 said, you know what? We can put these messages to our users and we can mobilize them to as in the election day. We can change the elections. This was a nature paper. Everyone clapped. Everyone said, wow, amazing. Facebook, nature paper. Well done. 2012, right? Barack Obama was elected. We like this outcome in academia. Great. Oh, you know what happens in 2016? 2016, Donald Trump was elected. And then now Facebook, oh my God, Facebook, you more like, you know, Cambridge Analytica, that's a disaster. This is not a secret. They told that it was in like in, in plain sight. They said we can mobilize people on the election day. A nature manuscript, not a small journal. But so so the idea that privacy privacy can change quite rapidly our attitude to privacy. It's really hard to navigate these like preferences. The last thing I would like to kind of like end my talk is this thing, right? I was thinking about this like you no know, the the. the um, 
recent decision by the Supreme Court about abortions, right? In, in, I'm not in the U.S. anymore, but, uh, you know, it, it affects the entire world, this decision. And people talked about, you know, like, oh, like, like now Google is actually now, now uh, deleting, like, the location of uh, uh, abortion clinics uh, for the history of people and things like that. Think about genetic privacy in this context. Think about that, you know, an embryo, an aborted embryo has quite a lot of DNA, that could be traced to a person. Now, guess what? If someone gets like, no, the hand of anonymous, of unidentified embryo, it cannot be that complicated to upload this information into websites and to trace the mother who aborted this baby or this embryo at this point. So, so you think about genetic privacy, that's like something that, you know, we need to take into account. So I said at the beginning, like a, a balanced view, and you see now a decision like that, that shakes like, you know, your trust in institutes. It shakes like, you know, the protections that people get. And let's remember this, like, Paul versus Wade was like about like privacy protections. Now, you, now these tools that can actually get you the, the golden state killer, they can solve crimes, amazing tools, suddenly can become quite scary if they are going unchecked and unregulated now i don't know what's the actual regulation of these tools with respect to abortions the department of justice had this uh, interim policy three years ago saying you should only use these tools in the case of a homicide or a rape you should not use them for other types of crimes but a this is a federal policy not state policy so state police doesn't need to abide to this policy. Second, whether local laws see abortion as a crime, I'm not like a lawyer, like a legal like scholar, but maybe under certain interpretation you could see that. And then what? Anyhow, that's kind of like my the end of my talk, and I would love to take any questions. That's like, like people that work really hard with me on different uh, manuscripts that I mentioned. Um, thank you very much, and they would love to take any questions from you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. We do have a packed schedule today. Thank you so much, Anise. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if we should at least take one question. What do you think, Bonnie? Sure. One question. I have okay. one if oh, uh, someone else is more important. Ask them. <laughs> Okay, we have one person waiting for the question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me here, or should you repeat the question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you? Okay, this is working now. Uh, we need on the online eyes to hear. Uh, great talk, you need. Thank you very much. Uh, one question that I have regarding the mapping of uh, patronymic surnames to um, to genotypes or to individuals, as it were, it seems to be working very well with uh, large scale stuff, like as you said, uh, North European and Americans and, and North Americans. How well does it work for populations uh, like African Americans, Jews, and indigenous people who were at some point forced or compelled to change their name, anglicize them, or just uh, shift them around and then? Uh, you know, things got a lot in, you know, mixed. So, um, you can yeah. Yeah. And talking about the white chromosome or the autosomal uh, matches? So I can um, you can talk about both. I was thinking of the Y, but the autosomal, I mean, you, you know the stuff. You talk about what you know. Yeah, the, the, the why we didn't, at that time, we didn't have, have enough data to actually differentiate between like different populations. So it potentially works the best for like, you know, European populations. And, and, and you ask about Jews, they're also overrepresented in these databases. Uh, um, now, if you, when we talk about autosomal uh, searches, we actually have supplemental figure number two or three in the manuscript, uh, creates a, back, a, a breakdown for different ethnic groups. Uh, for Afro-Americans, they are less represented, but instead of like 60%, you get like 40%. It's not that far away. Other like, you know, like if you talk about like East Asians in these databases, much less than that, just because they are underrepresented. Jews are overrepresented, you get actually quite good uh, uh, matching and also due to their genetic structure, it's like you get many hits. 
Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. So it's not like for, like if you think about Afro-Americans, it's not like zero. So they're also at risk in these databases, but unlike police databases who are biased against them, these databases are biased against, so to speak, if you use in this context, against the, uh, the European uh, uh, population.